Good afternoon, Class 19 Bravo. My name is Captain Gage Owens of Flight A6. Today I have the privilege of introducing our first guest speaker, Major Matt Jerry Voke, United States Air Force. Major Voke is currently a staff trainer at United States Special Operations Command, MacDill Air Force Base, Florida. Prior to his assignment, he was the Assistant Director of Operations and U-28 Weapons School Evaluator Pilot in the 14th Weapons Squadron, Hurlburt Field, Florida. Major Voke graduated from the United States Air Force Academy in 2006 and attended pilot training in Columbus Air Force Base, Mississippi. Following graduation from pilot training in 2008, he headed to Hurlburt Field, Florida, where he deployed 10 times flying the U-28. He attended weapons school in 2013 and has instructed new weapons officers since 2014. Major Voke is interested in the application and effects of artificial intelligence in the military and on society. While attending ACSC, he researched and wrote a thesis on artificial intelligence in the command and control of air power. Class 19 Bravo, please join me in welcoming Major Matthew Vogue. Appreciate it, thanks for the introduction. Uh, appreciate you guys having me. Uh, always good to be back. I guess I did a decent enough job last time uh, to get the invite back and I will reward you with a joke. What do you call a blonde that dyes her hair brown? Come on, guys. Artificial intelligence. That's gonna play into kind of what we're talking about a little bit today, and I'll, I'll one-up that a little bit. What do you call something that's brown and green and it would hurt if it fell out of a tree onto you? Nailed it. I bet none of you guys thought about that except for him. I just found you guys DG. What's your name? <laughs> Harris. Good job, Harris. None of you guys thought that because you were already triggered to think about tree things. It's a pool table. Get it? None of you guys even had pool table come to mind for something that's possible because you were already triggered, and we'll talk about some of that a little bit later. Uh, as he talked about, I am a staff trainer at SOCOM. I do have a passion for this. Hopefully, I will be able to instill a little bit on you guys during this brief. Uh, my research has been primarily in AI for air power, uh, but I've researched that elsewhere as well. Uh, to start off with, does anybody know what these companies have in common, MySpace, Borders, Blockbuster, Excite. Bankrupt, busted, utterly destroyed and dominated by adversaries with superior AI. How does Facebook have the ability to harness my wife for three hours in the evening just flipping through slideshows of cats and dresses from China? It's amazing to me. Amazon and Netflix recommenders keep people engaged. Netflix is now in the dictionary because of that. It's crazy. How does Google know that I love turtles? How do we transition from those adversarial defeats into the Air Force and DOD dominating their enemies, preventing wars from happening? The corporate America world is spending on average 32 to 35 percent increase annually in their budgets for AI. DoD right now is about 5.7 percent compound annual growth rate from 2012 to 2017. So the DoD is not growing anywhere near as fast as corporate America. So how do we meet General Goldfein's intent of creating multiple dilemmas across multiple domains at an overwhelming speed while preventing our enemy from doing the same? We need that AI, we need data, we need an augmented decision making so that we can arm our decision makers with the best information to make those decisions. General Hap Arnold once said, World War I was won by brawn, World War II was won by logistics, World War III, if it ever comes to that, will be won by information advantage and an ability to control the fight in time. So, how do I get me some AI? That's kind of what we're here to talk about but I don't want to get your expectations up too much. AI is a tool, it's not a destination. If you go out with a dream of implementing AI, you will fail. That application will fail. AI is a means to an end. The end should be that statement up top. That is our end game, that's where we're trying to get. And there is no, right now, 
commercial off-the-shelf system that you just plug and play as AI. We'll talk about some things that can help you, uh, but there is no off-the-shelf solution yet. How this brief is structured, we'll talk about what AI is, some types and challenges with AI, talk about some examples inside and outside the Air Force to kind of cage you guys into what is possible, and then talk about some future applications. In this, I'll use a weapon to target pairing as an example case. AI has a lot of different definitions. AI definitions change over time. In the strict sense, artificial intelligence is a machine that's able to do something that historically can only be done by humans. Is my new wave or Instapot artificially intelligent? Maybe. This is the definition as it currently stands right now that I dreamed up. Uh, it's kind of a little bit more accurate for what we expect out of AI right now. Number one, it's an unnatural agent. It's not present naturally in nature. It's made by humans or machines. It has the ability to learn and adapt. It's not just going to sit there once made and actually continue to learn and improve itself. And then we're going to set some goalposts by saying that it's on par or better with humans. That's my definition of AI, but like I said, it does change. AI requires data. It's not a technique. That's a rule. You have to have data. The more data, the better the data, the better the AI will be. AI is possible because of exponential growth. 2017 produced more data than the previous 5,000 years combined. I have more power, computational power, in my cell phone than not just the rocket that brought the astronauts to the moon, but all of NASA at the time. That's real power. And the algorithms and solutions that individuals, experts, are coming up with are also growing at an exponential rate, as you saw from some of those earlier in the video. AI solutions look different, and there is no cookie-cutter solution. So even if there was a commercial off-the-shelf system, you would still need to tailor that to your exact data sets and uh, problem set that you're facing. And if you have big data that's clean and applicable, the odds are you'll be able to tell correlations in that data once it's analyzed with AI. All right, here's some very gross oversimplifications of types of AI. And you can kind of think of these as Russian nesting dolls as present in the uh, picture. You have artificial intelligence. Inside that, there's a couple types which we'll go over. Computer vision, seeing something, interpreting that, putting that in ones and zeros. Natural language processing, if you want to think about Alexa or Siri, they're still not very good, but they can do a heck of a lot better job uh, than they used to be able to do, and they can actually analyze very complex uh, documents, such as medical and legal uh, journals, to feed that into computer databases. And then machine learning, uh, which has the ability to actually learn from data without being explicitly programmed to do specific things. Inside of machine learning, there's three basic types that are important to you guys here today. Supervised learning, meaning for input X, I have a tied output Y. So I'm able to supervise and teach that system using that labeled data. An example of this would be an image recognition. A simple image recognition of re recognizing a, a person or a cat, all the way up to recognizing a SCUD or an SA-11 and how they're different. Reinforcement learning. If you want to think about reinforcement learning in a simple way as maximizing a score, uh, think about it in games, scenarios, uh, simulations, wargaming. You're going to have a stair climbing or hill climbing method of trying to maximize a score or minimize certain things like civilian casualties or collateral damage. Unsupervised learning, you're going to use when there's not direct correlations visible to humans or you want the computer machine to find new correlations that you did not previously understand existed in that data. A good example of that is being used every single day in cyber and intrusion detection, for instance. What's our normal pattern of behavior, and why is this an outlier, and what should we do about that? Elon Musk's Twitter feed just got shut off because there was an outlier. I don't even pretend to know how outlandish that could have been, but example. Uh, neural nets, you guys have probably heard about. They're all the rage. What you might not know is neural nets have been around since the 60s. Uh, the perceptron was invented back then as a way to mimic the intelligence of the human brain. The proof existence of the human brain being intelligent yielded scientists to be able to experiment with that and replicate that. This is the only equation that's going to exist on my slides. You're basically summing up the weights that are coming into these neurons. If you want to think about these as neurons and dendrites with synapses, if you know biology, uh, then you can sum those up and you're going to get some sort of firing based on 
how you're gonna program that. If it's below a certain threshold, it's gonna be a zero output. If it's above a certain threshold, it's gonna be a one output, for instance. What are we able to do with this? So the Perceptron had a tw uh, 20 by 20 grid, which basically equates to 400 pixels that it's observing squares, triangles, and circles. It was able to distinguish those with one layer with those 400 uh, 20 by 20, which if you think about it was pretty mind blowing of the, this is in the 1960s we're talking about. What also was pretty amazing is if you started snipping some of these wires, it was able to adjust to that and learn uh, through that degradation, what's called graceful degradation, you guys might have heard about. Moving forward, how do we take that same thing and analyze a doll or a monkey or a dragonfly or something that's applicable to us here in the military, uh, like we're talking about a scud or a military age male or collateral damage concerns, etc. We obviously need a little bit more complicated of a neural network. And as you can see here, uh, it might be a little bit hard in the back, but these are hundreds of layers deep what's called deep learning. In this case, you're feeding in the same thing, pixels, and that's flowing through series of neural networks. The outcome is pretty astonishing. And you guys might have seen this on Amazon Photos or Google Photos, for instance, where you can have a photo and you can search this. How does it know that this is a Frisbee, much less that these guys are actually playing Frisbee? How, how can that, that could just be a spot on the ground but it knows that a young group of people is playing a game of Frisbee. This picture right here, it knows that two people are playing and are fighting over the puck. I don't see a puck, it's probably accurate, but how does it know that? It knows that because it was fed hundreds, maybe thousands of pictures of people playing hockey and fighting over that puck. And then here on the right, we can see a failure case of artificial intelligence where it thinks that a girl is um, blowing bubbles when a four-year-old would be able to tell that this girl isn't blowing bubbles. Moreover, I don't even think I'm 75% uh, sure that that is a girl in the first place. So you see some ambiguous and challenging areas where AI can fail and sometimes can fail catastrophically. I break down the application areas of AI into three basic categories. Uh, where would be good places to actually seek their use? Number one, we don't know the rules governing the data. There's just so much of it, and the ties are so loose to our human brains, or there's too many dimensions. I can only see in about four dimensions because I'm doing it right now, but the computer can see in hundreds of dimensions. A good example of this would be in mapping adversarial networks, uh, actually getting the ties in terrorist organizations, for instance. Something that wouldn't be easily perceptible to us, uh, analyzing uh, both secret and unclassed data. We know correlations exist, but we can't easily code those correlations as area number two. If you want to think about this, uh, you're writing a handwritten note to somebody else across the world. Uh, there's very few to no people actually analyzing the address that you wrote down on that note. That's all being done by artificial intelligence, analyzing that three and that H. It would be very difficult for you to guess how to code an explanation of how that three looks. It could be in cursive, it could be not, it could be slanted in italics, it could be bold, etc. It's very difficult for you to explain that to a computer. It's very easy using that training that we talked about earlier for them to come up with that. And you guys have probably heard of Project Maven that's going down right now. They're analyzing huge amounts of PED uh, RPA footage to extrapolate out of there the important things that we're needing to track in real time with intelligent analysts. Area number three, we can explain the data, but the scale and the scope or the time prevent us from being able to code a specific example. If you want to think about this as the Amazon and Netflix recommender system, those are too big, both the number of people and the number of movies, for an individual to be able to code a recommendation specifically to me. So we need that artificial intelligence to help us out with this. A good, awesome example of this use would be in a continuously updating air tasking order. Right now we do air tasking on a 72 hour plus cycle with 24 hour chunks of ATOs, which in my mind is completely uncalled for. We should be doing maybe a 24 hour window, rolling targets and other taskings with a continuously updated and tasked out uh, order to the aircraft and ground assets. Here are just a couple of the challenges with AI. Who is a data analyst, programmer, has programmed just for grins, 
Okay, some of you guys. You guys know that even when you get the programming exactly right, there are some challenges that come with that. Now try to increase the complicated nature in a complex environment, several orders of magnitude, and you're going to run into some changes or uh, challenges. AI is very good at very narrow application areas. The video that you saw earlier, those robots and other things were doing one specific thing, and they were doing it very well, a lot better than humans, including Go, including Dota. All these things that we thought would take hundreds of years for machines to supersede us in, uh, they're doing a lot better now. Artificial general intelligence is thought to be the holy grail, which is the ability for artificial intelligence to cross domains. You're really good at playing Go. Can you also predict the weather? The answer right now is no. Uh, once you're able to cross those domains with learning one domain, actually making you be able to learn better in the other domain, uh, that's going to be a very powerful uh, technology. Overpromising can be very dangerous. IBM faced this when they promised the ability to cure cancer and do a bunch of other things very off the shelf. Hey, just uh, buy it from us and it'll basically do everything you want it to. To a lot of companies saying that that's a lot more difficult than IBM was promising. And there was a little bit of a drawback. We've seen historically over time that there are what's called AI winters because of this over promising and under delivering. So that can be dangerous. The way to tackle that is the same way that you eat an elephant through an uh, agile or adaptive development of eating that elephant just one bite at a time, taking certain sprints of saying, I'm going to do this little bit here, and then I'm going to do another little bit, and then I'm going to do another little bit. And then by that time, you realize that you've actually tackled a pretty large problem set. Waterfall method. Who, who thinks that today's acquisitions is very responsive and gives us exactly what we need? There's not even like one acquisition guy in here that will raise their hand? <laughs> All right, so we need experts and we need an innovative culture. We need you guys to go out there, back to your units, go be leaders, and go be bold decision makers. When leaders get up here and they say they want you to be bold decision makers and you get frustrated because you're seeing the opposite rewarded, you're the, you're the solution to that. You're the fix. If you have questions on how to actually go out and smartly be a bold decision maker and leader, uh, ask during the Q&A. Safety and security are huge concerns and they need to start from day zero. Like Elon Musk said, even though he's a little bit doom and gloom, uh, those are very important right now. We need traceability, we need transparency, and we need the ability to control the systems. If you can't see what it's doing, you're not going to be able to control it, and you're not going to be able to foster trust in that system. Getting the data that is appropriate and the amount of data that's required for this is usually 80 to 85%, depending on the situation, of the problem itself is cleaning that data. Here's a couple more examples. Uh, we, we'll look at a couple from the tactical operational level, and then we'll ignore the st uh, strategic because of right now, uh, strategic level is very human intensive, and that is essentially the nature of war, and it's not changing right now. Maybe AI will cause it to change in the future, but we'll stick tactical, tactical to operational. Autonomy, we talked about. Uh, Rob Schreier was here last time talking about autonomy. There's some very, very cool things that are capable in autonomy, especially when you're talking about multi-domain command and control, when you're talking about A to AD environments, if you're looking at the big two from the MDS, for instance, uh, those are some very important things. Art uh, artificial intelligence assistance, anywhere from the tactical to operational level of arming that guy in the cockpit with the ability to distinguish what is a, a valid target and what's not, what are the ROEs, what are the collateral damage concerns, uh, to the woman behind a desk in the AOC that's pairing targets and doing the actual weaponeering towards that uh, and everything in between with decision makers um, having very little bandwidth to actually analyze the situation what's going on. You guys will see IA a lot, and that's intelligence augmentation. And not to be cute, confused with artificial intelligence, but AI can be significantly used for IA, and that is something that's very important. Common operating picture at the same time, very important at every single level, tailoring it to that guy in that cockpit, girl in that cockpit, also to that operational level, everybody in between, and as well as assessments after the fact, which historically the United States does very poorly on. Joint air tasking cycle and the joint uh, targeting cycle are two different things, often conducted in parallel, uh, but can be significantly leveraged in those as well, feeding through the cycle instead of replicating many things along the way. We'll look specifically at a weapon to target pairing. So I can use everything that we've uh, used in this first 10 to 15 minutes and then uh, apply it here in this example. In a weapon to target pairing, we're looking at a target 
and we're looking at what weapons we have avail available and then what's best to serve that target using proportionality distinction, rules of engagement, et cetera. In the left, we can feed in the target characteristics and environmental characteristics, such as target type, number, armor, mobility, et cetera, with GPS availability, obscurance, et cetera. Through a neural net, which this is not an accurate representation, this would actually be significantly more deep, if you will, with many more layers. But in a neural net, you generally want to make the middle skinnier than the outside so that you can generalize the problem instead of just overfitting the neural net to the actual examples. And then outcome on the right is going to be a PK, for instance, in this, um, with the weapon of target fusing. In this case, uh, you're going to want to run these through rules, in this case, ROE, and other things such as cost, uh, for instance, to come out with an accurate representation of what you want so that every single time you're not going to use the 1.0, which has a PK of 1, which is great, but that's a nuclear weapon, can't be used in this situation. In order to assess whether that weapon to target pairing example is good or not, we need something to compare it to. So the number one way to compare that would be to compare it to humans. Easy. Is this better at pairing weapons to targets than a human would be? Another example would be to come up with a comparable AI system. And the uh, nearest neighbor is a very easy form of AI. It's just taking your data, plotting it, and then plotting your test example, and then choosing the nearest neighbor. We'll use Los Angeles as an example with gang affiliations. We're trying to find the gang affiliation for this target we just pulled off the street using his latitude and longitude. We know his location. We're going to look towards his nearest neighbor since he was on the 18th street. He's probably a member of the 18th street gang. Easy. Extrapolate that forward into high dimensional space. It gets a little bit more complicated, but it's essentially the same exact problem. The challenge with nearest neighbor occurs when your test, or your test case doesn't meet your data, if there's holes in that data. So you want to fill those data holes as much as you can. But displayed in high dimensional space, which this would probably be about a 10 to 12 dimension space, obviously not depicted accurately. You're going to put the test case there. The nearest neighbor is this right here. The solution would be, in this case, a GBU-12 contact. A lot easier to run usually very prone to holes in data. Where do we go from here? What's the future? We don't know. Here's a couple ideas of what the future can hold. We've already seen artificial intelligence being used a little bit in RPAs. RPAs right now are not, they do not have the ability to go out, actually out and not act autonomously, but they will require that in that MDC2 fight and that A2AD AD environment but we have to be able to trust them first. We talked about uh, Pilot Training Next probably in you guys' classes a little bit. Uh, pilot Training Next is trying to figure out if we're doing pilot training the right way. Is one year of everybody goes at the same speed the best for training a person to be able to fly a plane? Or can we put them in a lot of simulation and actually adjust feedback and progression based on their actual behavior their stress level and everything that we're actually gathering real time to adjust that training to that person. What would it look like if you actually had all the information that you needed on the battlefield? That would be pretty awesome, right? But the fog and friction of war will never go away. That's always going to be there. But AI can help arm the warfighter with a better situational awareness of the battle space. Predictive analytics. Like I said, the assessment in wartime is very poor. There's a good book, if you guys want to read it, called Assessing War uh, that covers this in, in depth. And Vietnam is a very good case study in this. We oftentimes create the metrics for our anal analysis while we're creating the plan. Uh, we need to do a better job of objectifying war. MALDs, anybody ever employ a MALD? Nobody? MALDs are pretty dumb. They should be smart, but they're pretty dumb. We need MALDs to be able to act like actual um, players in the air so that they can't be distinguishable from aircraft. So we can get the MALDs shot down and not the F-16s and F-22s. Here's a couple takeaways for you guys condensed. AI is an unnatural agent with the ability to learn and adapt to changes on par or better than humans. AI is a tool. It's not a destination. Keep that in mind. How do we have this wicked problem that we're trying to solve that has massive amounts of data? Maybe we can apply AI, not working back from AI. 
There are literally countless areas. We went over just a couple of them here today. Uh, hopefully, we'll go over a couple in Q&A, but uh, it is literally limitless. Focus on good data and try not to overhype the situation. Hopefully, AI will, prov uh, will provide us with that next overmatch or offset or whatever you want to call it, RMA, et cetera. And success or failure of the implementation lies in implementation, implementation details of that safety and security, et cetera. Do you want to know more? Still a good time frame, right? You guys have seen Starship Troopers? OK, cool. Just making sure. Uh, these are some really good books that you guys can research if you want some follow-ups. Machine Learning, this was put out by the MIT Press. It's a one-stop shop, very plain language, uh, so easy for pilots to understand. Technology versus Humanity goes through what's strong with machines, what's strong with humans, and how do we mix those two together. I'll uh, lump superintelligence and the singularity is near kind of in the same futurist uh, bucket. Both of those good. Nick Bostrom's awesome. Uh, Army of One, Paul Shari uh, talks about autonomy and autonomous weapons primarily uh, with a directive that he uh, helped write and some of the considerations for that. Mouse master algorithm covers some of the tribes of artificial intelligence and how we can potentially combine all of those into an artificial general intelligence. Still a pipe dream, but it's at least getting us towards that. And if you guys want more on this, uh, shoot me an email. Uh, it is FOUO, so I can't distribute, uh, distribute that openly. But if you shoot me an email, uh, I'll be able to give that to you guys. Look forward to you guys' questions later. Appreciate you guys having me. Thank you. Gentlemen, uh, Captain Wheeler, I'm an MQ-9 pilot from NOLIS. And uh, hearing you talk about the, uh, particularly the way that the different services are looking at how they're going to implement AI. I see a potential pitfall with particularly the command and control piece of getting five different ways of how we're going to do this and them not talking to one another. Are we doing anything to make sure that as a joint force, the way we're approaching AI is going to be interoperable so that we don't end up with this stove piped command and control decision making process? So I don't have a super positive answer for that. Um, we're, AI is still pretty nascent. I think the services are, at this point, really focused on infrastructure development, right? What are the networks? What's the computational environment? What are data hygiene standards so that if we have you know, data, how can we share it? Um, much less. Uh, and I don't think you want to necessarily mandate a, an AI algorithmic standard of this is how I'm going to process, because it's so situational dependent, right? The al AI algorithm you put in the back of a jet is probably going to be so totally different than what you put on a ship or what you put on, say, a, a maneuvering constellation, right? So uh, I, I don't think, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing either. And I think it's probably wise of the services to say, if we can establish common pipes and common ways to ingest and, and understand each other's data, then the local instantiations of the AI should be OK. It, now, where it gets more complex is if we're truly nesting operations, understanding how the AI, right, you're going to have to transfer the assumptions, the underlying assumptions of why the AI came up with the answer that it came up so that it's quantifiable and understandable at, say, upper or lower echelons. So I'll take that and go a little bit different from there, but a, a big concern just along with what you're talking about with the prep, you know, proprietary and stovepipe standards and infrastructure, um, et cetera is the classification of that. So we have a system that's going to be making decisions. We may or may not have authority to actually see what's driving those decisions. Some of it could be pulled from the secret side. Some could be pulled from the TS, some from the open source, uh, and then some from even some SAP or, or STO methods. How do you feed all that information through a system, through a model? and get answers, and then how do you strip out their requirements to deliver that to the warfighter where they need it at a, at a classification level that they can see it. So they might, for instance, uh, see an SA-10 located a specific location on the battlefield, 
We may or may not be able to tell them the lips or accuracy of that. We may or may not be able to tell them how we achieve that location. Uh, so that provides some obvious challenges for uh, developing an accurate battlefield update for the warfighter and then working solutions off of that. So toss that on top of the AI and you can rapidly see that there's some, some large challenges out there. People are thinking about some of that stuff. Um, but just searching through the multi-layer classification issues alone is uh, extremely challenging. So that is something that needs to be looked at and is being looked at right now. It's just there aren't very good incentives for companies to develop a standard and to get everything to work and talk to each other, uh, even for simulation and LVC things. Uh, it's a problem much less for the actual, uh, like you're talking about, command and control. So bridging the tactical to operational and everything uh, in between. And if I can pig pile on just a little bit. So the Joint AI Center, has anybody here heard of Joint AI Center? Wow. So the Joint AI Center is basically the US response to China and Russia going, this is a national strategic imperative. Uh, and it's a culmination of what started as third offset strategy. A microcosm of that was Project Maven. The Joint AI Center has stood up um, and there are national mission initiatives um, that we probably won't talk about in here, but um, the Joint AI Center will use DARPA as its primary research arm, and then there are national mission initiatives, some of which are specifically to get after this, right? What does what the joint infrastructure look like? What are, where, how do I create a joint repository for tools and algorithms and data? Uh, and how do I distribute that, right? So there's not a single point of failure, um, much like some of my you know, finishing comments. Um, MLS, right, multi-layer security or cross-domain solution, CDS. Those technologies exist. Uh, the Joint AI Center, one of its top challenges is uh, teaching about, you know, how do we implement data hygiene and MLS. Um, so it is, it is very high in people's awareness and it's a high priority because otherwise we just have a bunch of fragmented stuff, right? We're really not synergistically solving the problem. Good question. Uh, hello, I'm Sean King from Scott Air Force Base, and my question is, how are we selecting the directions in which we are examining applying AI to Air Force problems? Uh, to clarify a little bit, AI is an extension of the age-old question, I have a human who does a task, I would like to build a device that does a task instead. Uh, so you talk about Russia, you talk about China, Russia's trying to automate out their actors, get the AI to do the actions for them. China, like us, is trying to automate out some of the decision makers. What criteria are we, are we using to say this task should be automated, maybe this one shouldn't? Or are we looking at it from the perspective a little closer to the civilian industry, which is every task should be automated if I can? probably more aware of the So um, I think there's a little bit of both of what you identified. I, I think there's clearly an effort, uh, again, both at the J Jake and at the service levels to tackle some low-hanging fruit and show success. Because part of this is marketing not just to Congress, right, for to Congress to approve the budget and for Congress to trust the military to deploy AI successfully. Part of it is getting past, senior leadership is bought in, right? Uh, this crowd, I would think, is bought in, right? You're digital natives, you want these kind of capabilities. You know, there's a term frozen middle, kind of that 05, 06, sorry, uh, seven level uh, that we don't reward risk and we're talking a lot about acquisition risk and how do you operationalize that and show an ROI that says it's worth us doing this. And so there are tremendous challenges at the acquisition uh, level. And so that's where I think they're going after some commercial technologies and commercial kind of parallels, um, predictive analytics, predictive maintenance, predictive logistics, predictive health, those kinds of things, which easily parallel to the commercial world. 
And then the more challenging, which we both you know, kind of focused on, is MDC2. And how do you, in my mind, it's relatively easy how you quantify that and generate an ROI. Can I make it faster? Can I ingest more complex data and have a more robust decision? Um, but and it, just before we were walking out, experimentation is the key to that, right? Having an environment and infrastructure that supports it and then being able to do the experimentation because no one, it's like when, if you're at the AOC and H, you know, D-Day and H-Hour are an hour away and Spook walks in with a black box and goes, here you go, it's the magic. No one's going to accept that, right? We need to do experimentation and V&V &V and T&E &E and training and get comfortable with it and have you come up with the great ideas and push them upward while leadership is providing the umbrella saying, this is the game changer that will win or lose wars. That's, so there's, they're coming at it from both ends is what I see. The low hanging fruit to start generating success and figure out how to get through the programmatic piece of it and then identifying those key challenges like MDC2 um, and trying to figure out, well, how are we gonna get there, right? What's the best way to do this? I don't think, in my opinion, and I'll be interested to hear yours, I don't think there's any, we want AI to do everything, right? It's not, a, it's not that. We want to be very selective about where can I free up human beings to be more creative and more, more command oriented by getting rid of drudge work uh, and or where can I create a combat differentiator? I could talk forever literally on that question. Uh, I wrote a background, uh, bullet background paper on that. If you're curious, um, just email me and I can send it to you. It's also FOU. Uh, there's a couple of easy ways to think about that. Is there an event that is very human process intensive? And is there a sufficient amount of data to it? That's probably an area where we could use artificial intelligence. The appetite and the return on investment potential is another uh, question all on itself, right? Am I going to actually be able to leverage artificial intelligence or something solution wise that'll actually alleviate those man hours? And then am I actually able to accept that it's replacing that human doing that job and I can move them elsewhere? Whole nother conversation. The way I see this big picture is risk and time. If an event is risky and it involves a lot of time uh, or even a little bit of time, I'm gonna lean a lot more towards the human being the one that does that. So if you wanna think about it, strategic events. If there is a low risk and something that needs to be done very quickly, low amount of time, that's gonna be a lot easier to offload that into uh, the, uh, the autonomy domain uh, because there's a lot less chance of something going wrong and actually um, being detrimental to actual lives on the battlefield. Uh, there's a lot more that play into that. He mentioned a little bit of it, but confidence in the system and trust as well. There have been autonomous weapons and autonomous machines out there for a long time. A lot of them aren't being used not because they're illegal in the international light, but because we aren't confident that they will target what we want them to be targeting with the ability to distinguish to a sufficient level uh, what we're not hoping to target. So the Harpy was an example of that back in, I think, the 80s, um, but hasn't been used because there's a the potential for it to target things that we're not uh, looking to. So is a human doing something that requires a lot of hours? Uh, is there a lot of data? And is there some sort of ROI? And then the areas that I would stay away from, from the, for the time being, are the core areas. Creativity, originality, responsibility, and empathy. Those are areas where humans still have a distinct advantage. Uh, machines are not able to create their own entropy. And when I say entropy, I mean um, essentially a randomness that we value as humans. So even if a machine expresses creativity or originality, that's just what it's been taught to do. Uh, you could maybe even make an argument that that's what humans are doing, but that's for another conversation as well. But stick to that core area for distinctly human <clears throat> endeavors. I also think um, it's not an either or, right? Again, AI is not trying to replace human beings. AI is trying to augment human beings. And so, uh, those, again, those low-hanging fruit where there are lots of data like maintenance, logistics, uh, medical, that's again, you're not replacing humans, right? You're freeing up specialists to, to verify what it's gonna go through thousands and thousands of things that you would never be able to go through. Uh, on, the, on the flip side, you know, one of your core values there, creativity, 
we want to allow creativity, but perhaps we will direct the AI to offer that to us to make a final decision because it is um, a little more concerning. Do you guys remember my joke about the pool table? The reason I, I said that was because the moment that I asked you what brown and green and it would hurt if it fell out of a tree is because it immediately, immediately cages your mind on thinking about trees and things that are in trees. If you were a machine, you know, an artificial intelligence, and I asked you that, you probably wouldn't have that same predilection to start there and then potentially would have just thought about, hey, what's green and brown? It would hurt if it fell out of, you know, on, onto you. So the human brain can only serially process about 12 things a second. So we have a, a lot of shortcuts uh, that are forcing us to do things, which helps and it also hurts sometimes. Uh, so leveraging that in a synergistic way with AI, just to your point, is, is where we should be moving. Not you know, distinctly separating them, but, but fusing those together. Good question, thanks. Gentlemen, Captain Jones from Minot. I'd say as a society, we've seen a lot of concern about the uh, potential moral implications of artificial intelligence and military operations, uh, specifically looking at intelligence surveillance and autonomous weapons. Uh, when we're looking at potential adversaries and we see that they're pursuing these types of technologies, can we afford to, to hold back from some of those based on the ethical concerns? I love this question. That's, that's like one of the most important questions, right? Um, it's, it's difficult. And we mentioned Project Maven earlier. Uh, there was a protest signed by those employees, 3,100 employees that basically said, hey, we're not gonna do this. And they had a mass exodus, which I think um, equated to 12 employees quitting. But long story short, that project's being discontinued and I think it was a five-year contract. So there are implications to this. And I bet that's not gonna happen in China, right? So with the Chinese intelligentization of the force, they're not gonna have that uh, moral high ground necessarily that we do. They might have some moral high ground in places that we don't. Uh, the problem there is that, um, are you guys familiar with the trolley problem? Okay, a lot of, lot of north-south. Uh, so the trolley problem is hard because you and I don't see the trolley problem in the same light. Our solutions to it um, will likely bring up more questions, inter you know, looking internally into ourselves and actual answers. Uh, it's very, very difficult to place, like you're saying, morals and ethics into a machine. So we need to get on the same page of where we are there uh, before we start looking at it as an us and them kind of a thing. Uh, I love Google's you know, take on that, uh, do no evil, it's, that's real nice. We don't have that luxury in the military of black and white, everything lives in the gray. Uh, but we do owe, to your point and your question, an honest assessment internally to ourselves as individuals and as a force of where those clearly black, clearly white, and then gray lines are. So if, if I pick on the Google example a little bit more, so 3,100 signed the letter, you know, very few people left the company. Uh, and remember, the company is much bigger than 3,100. Um, the nation is in an uproar for 24 to 48 hours after Snowden. And then it's, it's gone, right? Uh, treason, did we do anything? No. So there, there's a lot of public discussion about moral and ethics. And then there's what the military has to deal with, right? And we are not going to be fighting. I mean, we will be fighting some public perception. But if we're engaged in acts of war, legal acts of war, that is a different construct entirely. Um, I did, a, did some work uh, a few years ago. Very similar question at Cybercom, right? Are we going to be allowed to use cyber weapons? Will you Title 10 warriors be allowed to? Why would we ever build cyber capabilities? We'll never be allowed to use them. It's completely not true, right? If, you're, if you develop capabilities to address military problems in a future named operation, it's perfectly legal. You owe it to your future commanders to provide them options. 
w whether we decide to execute those options, nuclear, cyber, AI-enabled warfare, we have to have those options because we don't know what the future holds. And, and that is a different environment than having a public debate about privacy and, you know, am I, am I being fooled by bots? Is fake news being generated by bots? Right? They're, 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 we have to separate the conversations. So not only do we owe our commanders military options and capabilities that can execute those options, but we need to think through how would we employ them if called upon. So we have to go through, and we can't be hamstrung by, oh, well, I'll, just, I'll never be allowed to be used because that's a moral ethical question that, that I can't address. So I, I, and I'm not belittling your question at all. I think it's hugely important, but I think we tend to hide behind it uh, and go, I'm not going to explore AI because, one, it makes my brain hurt. It's hard. I don't understand the ROI. How are we going to implement that? Oh, there's all kinds of acquisition challenges. And, oh, by the way, there's a moral and ethical. Uh, we, we, have to, we have to bite into it, address it. Um, I think, again, experimentation, live virtual constructive to really play these things out and, and understand, are there actually moral and ethical questions? Or... Again, kind of this point, it's not AI, not AI. If there's a man in or on the loop, does that eliminate a lot of those uh, potential moral and ethical dilemmas? What, what checks can we put in place that will allow us to have the full range of op military options? Good afternoon, gentlemen. One of the creepier sort of implications of artificial intelligence is this transhumanism, the idea of merging man and machine, right? All of us pretty much are carrying around cell phones today, right? So it's not too much of a stretch, I guess, to realize that maybe we'll come to the day where people want their device, you know, embedded within them, right? And Google already sort of had a project like that. Remember the Google Glass? And they canceled it because people were just so creeped out by it, right? So do you think there's a day coming where people will eventually, like, get over that uh, sort of, like, heebie-jeebies of people having, like, cameras and being basically cyborgs? And is that something that we'd have to be worried about? So would you wear them? What's that? Would you wear them? Hell no. <laughs> okay, but, but why? I'm profoundly uncomfortable with the idea of, you know, what, what, what does it mean to be human at that point anymore? Like, when you are merging, you know, with, because it's the Internet of Things, right? It's essentially, like, you know, I, I'd assume you're going to be connected to the world, World Wide Web there, right? So then it's like how much of my own individuality is preserved in that, right? When we're all wearing Google trademark products and becoming an extension of, of a Google server, essentially, I'm not particularly comfortable with that. So, so what you hit upon, uh, there's a couple things, right? Is it embedded or not, right? And DARPA certainly has programs. Uh, I'll let you talk to what you may or may not have. Um, so some of it's style and culture and perception, right? A lot of people that complain because you felt like a dork, right? Because you got a little thing in front of your eye. But how many people 20 years ago thought they were going to be wedded to their iPhone 24-7, right? Um, before that, the cell phone, right? Just a regular old gigantic cell phone. So there'll be generational adoption. Uh, but I also think demonstrating utility beyond a trinket. So there are a lot of programs going on in DoD and IC where people are using goggles to overlay tons of information. And it's fused information, and it's for a purpose, right? So just getting your email and doing ding, 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 okay. Well, guess what? A lot of people are wearing watches that do the same thing. And maybe because it's less obtrusive, they did a little bit more style. Okay, I'm not a dork. You know, um, we, ha we have forces out there now that have, are using either, you know, Oculus or HoloLens, Magic Leap. If you guys have heard about that, Google it. It is wicked cool. So instead of projecting information against your, basically your personalized HUD, and figure out what information do I want? Can I look at that building? Oh, by the way, Ericsson, completely Internet of Things, wired their nation 10 years ago 
So that if I'm an EMS responder, I put on my, you know, put on all my gear and my hood has a heads up display and it's gonna tell me the address, the best route, uh, the blueprints for all that, where all the w water access points are. There's a ton of information. Okay, who lives there? What, you know, how many people are in the family? Um, there's all kinds of stuff that that firefighter has available to him, right? That is mission enhancing. We have forces that are doing that on the bridge of ships, fused information, I get the AIS data, I get track data, I can actually now, even in dark and fog, understand my complete environment and it's right there. We talked about uh, multi-layer security. What if I'm uh, in the AOC and I get everything but there I can sub-compartmentalize and so now I can open up my ops floor potentially be SAPF and SCIF, right? Because I can compartmentalize and those are biometrically identified so they can't be compromised. You can't pick up my glasses. And this isn't, this isn't crazy 20 years from now stuff, right? This all technologically exists. It's about force adoption, right? And so you guys and girls, I'm sorry, you men and women are the ones that are gonna push this, right? Leadership is, yeah, we're, we're on board, you are gonna have the good ideas. You guys are gonna bring the, the cool capability. Um, in Australia, the two star in charge of army capability development talk, spent her entire 30 minute period in an air power conference talking about combat geek and how we need to have, uh, whether it's a data scientist or a coder in combat, bless you, in combat units right, to dynamically either change the AI algorithm, tweak the data so it gets what you need, you know, ensure that you've got fused data to your, whatever your interface de de device is. Um, so I think one, it's generational, two, it's gotta be utility. Uh, it, it, it's completely available. I think we're probably a long ways from accepting, uh, I wanna change my memory upload and retrieval capability uh, all of the matrix. The technology, honestly, is pretty darn close. We're working with a company uh, where we're actually <laughs> encoding ridiculous amounts of data at high speed and high retrieval speed uh, on genetic material. Um, so all the parts and pieces are there. Getting into the cybernetics, again, will raise some, some moral and ethical questions, but you want to add anything? Yeah, so we're already augmented, right? The problem is that it's a bandwidth issue. Uh, I can't get as much information from my phone or put enough information in my phone to put everywhere else. Um, Elon Musk uh, has a company that's working through that right now. Supposedly have an update here in the next couple months, but um, it, it, there are ways of doing it without being intrusive, but obviously the, the best way to do that as far as bandwidth goes is to be intrusive, AKA you have electrodes sticking out of your head. Um, so, uh, they've done that in mice. It doesn't mer matter in some cases where they put the electrodes. Your brain learns to interface through that. Just like we were talking about on the neural net. If you snip some wires, put in some extra, you know, neurons, it's able to figure that out and work around that. So, the question is, what do we want to do with that, right? Are we the pinnacle of intelligence on Earth is a good question to ask yourself. If not, if there's gonna be something that supersedes us, you know, is our legacy, um, how are we going to keep ourselves gainfully employed as pretty pink bodies living on this world? Is it gonna be in the form of a dog that they like to keep around as pets? Or is it gonna be um, that we've kind of learned to live, you know, live symbiotically um, with, you know, whatever, whomever that is? Uh, some some deep questions as far as using that. Uh, yeah, we have augmented you know human operators on the battlefield right now. Everything from a jawbone mic uh, to just like you're talking about, we have JTACs that go out with a HUD that they're seeing a rover feed. They're seeing all the spies. They're seeing all the aircraft uh, just like that. And then we also have things like the Taylor suit uh, that enables an operator to send back their real time um, biometric data, sends real time video. They can experience theoretically what the operator is experiencing on the battlefield, you know, things like that. So we are augmented already. It's just 
how can we use that efficiently, effectively, and then how far do we want to take it? I know a lot of people back when cell phones were uh, starting to come out that refused to use a cell phone. Not many of those people nowadays just because they can't um, essentially work in, in today's world. So I'm not, I'm not a clairvoyant person, but I imagine that our, our minds towards this will shift and it'll probably shift, like he was saying, with you guys before it'll shift with uh, the older people that are leading those efforts, technically. <laughs> so what, to add one, we talk a lot about visualization uh, as, as a kind of a primary means of interface or natural language processing, right, uh, Siri, Cortana. Um, don't forget about haptics, right? And typically that's gloves, but uh, you can actually have much improved speed of recognition and, and, and understanding if you are if you use your whole body as a haptic surface and and wherever you get tapped or whatever kind of vibration or interaction you get uh, gives you nonverbal communication um, there there's the value of that there's also the value of you know some sensory deprivation things if you're doing purely visual and not haptic feedback um, so for you that are interested you know check out haptics uh, Australia's actually done some really interesting stuff in haptics and there's some really good TED Talks to cover a bunch of the things we just talked about. Thanks. Good job. Thanks. We scared off the other guy. That's OK. Perfect. Major Voke and Mr. McCurry, thank you for coming and sharing your expertise with us today. We are living in exciting times. Advancements in artificial intelligence are helping us to push the boundaries of what's possible. Things once considered Hollywood fantasies and science fiction are currently being tested and developed in labs around the world. As leaders and airmen, it is our responsibility to understand these technologies and help guide our Air Force in deciding how they will be utilized. We may not know exactly um, how to use uh, these technological advancements or the impact um, they will have on the future of humanity or the battlefields of tomorrow, but we have between now and then to get ready. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the Artificial Intelligence Symposium. Thank you for attending. Major Voke and Mr. McCreary will remain at the, be at the front of the auditorium for a few minutes to answer any additional questions you may have. Thanks. Have a great day. Thanks for having us. Good job, man. Yeah. It was fun. Yeah.